So I'm gonna get started. Um, my name is Alyssa and I am an attorney at the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless. And I will be presenting today with Claire Bowman, who is the resource and training coordinator for the Students in Temporary Living Situations Program. Um, so thank you guys so much for being on this webinar. Um, we will be talking today about supporting students in temporary living situations with CPS returning to in-person learning. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to write them in the um, question and answer portion and we will go through them um, at the end of the presentation. Hey. So, um, like I mentioned, I work at the Law Project of the Chicago Coalition for the Homeless. Um, we are a mobile legal clinic and we provide uh, legal assistance to um, families and youth um, and children who are experiencing homelessness. Um, and we help with civil and some limited criminal legal services. So I'm our education attorney. Um, and work on making sure students have access to the resources that they need to succeed in school when they are experiencing housing insecurity. Um, and I'm now gonna hand it over to Claire to talk a little bit about the Students in Temporary Living Situations Program. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Claire Bowman. I'm the Resource and Training Coordinator with the CPS Students in Temporary Living Situation Program. We are the program um, within CPS that provides services and supports to all students, um, including those in early learning up through 12th grade at any CPS school who are experiencing homelessness. This does include charter schools, option schools, um, and other schools that are um, uh, governed by CPS, but may not be a traditional district school. Um, the goal of our program is to protect the educational rights of students in temporary living situations and to ensure that um, barriers that those students may be facing um, or assistance needed is provided um, so that they can um, be successful in school. Next slide. A key component to the STLS program is um, our school-based STLS liaisons. Every single school um, in CPS, including charter schools, does have at least one staff person assigned as the STLS liaison. Typically, in most schools, this is going to be someone who may be the um, clerk, uh, a counselor, social worker, case manager. Um, and their primary duties are um, around um, enrolling students um, who are experiencing homelessness in school without delay, um, helping identify students who are experiencing homelessness, um, informing um, students and parents about their transportation rights as an STLS student, um, and ensuring that they are being provided transportation assistance that they qualify for, um, as well as helping to connect students and families with um, educational services, which may be um, connecting with preschool programs, health services, um, healthcare in the community, dental or mental health care, and other community resources as needed. Um, this school year, we had um, uh, 17 schools that have brand new um, STLS advocate positions, which are actually full-time staff at um, 17 of our CPS schools that have the highest um, historic STLS enrollment um, to make sure that students at those schools are getting um, adequate support um, while they are in a temporary living situation. So we've been um, really excited to, to bring out um, sort of that additional level of support at some of our schools this year. Great, right. so um, as Claire talked a little bit about the STLS program, um, I want to explain a little bit about the federal law um, that protects the rights of students who are experiencing housing insecurity. Um, so the law is called the McKinney Vento Homeless Assistance Act. Um, it impacts every state, every public school, um, and it gives certain rights and protections to students. So in CPS, students who are McKinney Vento eligible, um, the program that supports them is STLS, the Students in Temporary Living Situations Program. So I wanted to go through the definition of students who would be considered eligible um, for mckinney Vento. So there's kind of two different ways to look at it. So the first is the law goes through very ex specific examples of who counts. Um, so those living in an emergency or transitional shelter may be what we kind of most typically think of when we think of someone who is experiencing housing insecurity. Um, and then it also includes those who are sharing housing of others due to loss of housing, economic hardship, or a similar reason. 
Um, and we colloquially refer to that as living doubled up. So this might mean when someone loses their housing and they need to stay on the couch um, with a friend or a relative. Um, and this is by and large the most common way that people in Chicago experience homelessness. Um, they are living doubled up. Um, and, and part of this is the limited um, you know, access to shelters or um, the rules around shelters that make it harder for families to access. Um, so most families are experiencing homelessness living doubled up. Um, and I think especially during the pandemic, this has been a very difficult um, way to be living. Um, and I know sometimes we can think of sharing housing as being maybe better um, than staying in a shelter, but it has a lot of risks, especially with social distancing and health concerns and overcrowded spaces. Um, so the McKinney Vento also includes those living in motels, hotels, trailer parks, camping grounds, due to the lack of alternative adequate accommodation, um, living in cars, parks, public spaces, abandoned buildings, substandard housing. Um, and I wanted to flag substandard housing because there can be times when a family maybe technically um, rents or, or owns a home, um, but they don't have the um, financial or other means to make it a safe place to live. Um, so maybe they technically have a house, but there's not running water or electricity, or there's some other reason that makes it unsuitable. That can also count. Um, and then also in a primary nighttime residence not designed for or ordinarily used as a regular sleeping accommodation for human beings. Um, and what the example I kind of point to for this one um, is a we had a, a client whose um, the mother worked at a hair salon and they could not afford housing. And so her and her child would actually sometimes sleep in the, the salon. So yes, that's a building, but we wouldn't think of that as a place for like an ordinary regular sleeping accommodation. Um, and then migratory children living in any of the above described situations. So as you can tell, McKinney Vento is very fact specific. Um, and this is one of the roles that liaisons um, do that is very important is really figuring out what is the living situation in a sensitive um, way to the families, really figuring out what's going on. So that's kind of the first section is these specific examples. But then even if a family doesn't necessarily meet one of those, you go to the top of this definition, which also includes those who lack a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence. So even if a family maybe doesn't fit into one of these categories, but by you know, asking questions, by thinking through the living situation, it becomes clear that their living situation is not fixed, that it's not regular, that it's not adequate, they can still be considered um, to be homeless and to meet the McKinney-Vento eligibility, um, which is why the definition is really important. Um, then also, those who are considered unaccompanied homeless youth, um, which would be a child or youth who's not in the physical custody of a parent or guardian and meets any of the definitions on the prior slide, also is considered to be mckinney Vento eligible. And the term they use is unaccompanied homeless youth, but there's not actually an age limit. Um, there's no age restriction. So if you have a preschool student who is not in the physical custody of their parents um, or and does not have an official legal guardian, maybe they're staying with an aunt or a grandma, um, they could still be considered um, an unaccompanied homeless youth. And I'm gonna pass it back on to Claire. So as Alyssa mentioned, um, any student who is in a living situation that meets that McKinney-Vento um, Act definition of homelessness is eligible for the STLS program. There's no other parameters that need to be met around income levels um, or other situations. It really is based on what is that student's living situation and does it fall into one of those categories that Alyssa described or meet that expectation of not being fixed, regular or adequate housing. When it comes to STLS eligibility, there's no proof of homelessness that's required. Um, schools um, do not have to require families to show eviction notices, letters from homeless service agencies or shelters, or notarized letters from um, you know, families or the head of household that they are doubled up with. That kind of documentation is not required for STLS enrollment. 
Um, however, STLS liaisons will um, use sensitive and respectful questioning to understand what a student's living situation is and determine eligibility. Um, so, you know, we do really encourage families to be open and honest about their living situations. Um, so that they can you know, share this information with their liaison to get connected with the STLS program and take advantage of the supports that it does provide for eligible students. Um, in addition, um, it is required that families do provide the address where a student is residing. They don't need to provide proof of this address. There's no need to have leases or utility bills or um, you know, photo identification with that address listed. It needs to be provided simply so that um, you know, the school can verify what all of the options for school enrollment that that student has um, to make sure that those are all understood and considered. Um, and one thing I too just wanted to add on, I know sometimes families get hesitant to present this information um, to liaisons, but, you know, presenting um, that you are experiencing homelessness or staying, you know, staying in a shelter or living double does not necessarily trigger any DCFS involvement. Um, it's not going to your immigration status doesn't matter for eligibility. Um, so I know sometimes there's fear fear around that, but it really is if you you know talk to the liaison, the person at the school, it's to make sure the child has access to those resources that are part of the STLS program. Um, and so there doesn't you know it can be this really great resource that doesn't need to um, kind of provide any of that fear. Um, when it comes to enrolling into the STLS program, this takes place at the student's school that they're enrolled at. Um, again, you know, speaking with the school's STLS liaison is the best way to get connected. Liaisons and other staff will also, um, you know, look for indicators that a student may be in a temporary living situation and reach out directly to a parent or guardian um, to ask about their living situation. Um, but again, you know, we do encourage families to um, speak with their liaison directly and share information about their living situation to ensure that they are getting connected to the program. Um, it's important to note that enrollment into the STLS for program um, is required every single school year. So if a student's enrolled in the STLS program um, in the following school year, they need to be re-enrolled. There will not be any automatic carryover from school year to school year. Um, so that's something to also note for um, families to bring it up every year with their school liaison um, to make sure that they are getting enrolled in the program. Um, once a, a parent or guardian or an unaccompanied student has spoken with their liaison, again, they'll ask some questions about the living situation to verify it does meet that McKinney-Vento definition of homelessness. Um, and if it does, then the liaison will help um, the parent or guardian or unaccompanied student with completing what we call the STLS service initiation form. Uh, this is a, a very simple document that really just captures um, that the student is in a temporary living situation. And again, the liaison will provide assistance in actually filling that form out. Um, you know, because enrollment is required every year, we do recommend that any family that's in a temporary living situation does, you know, reach out to their school to confirm that they are actively enrolled in the STLS program um, for the school year, because, you know, that's what's going to help connect them with the um, services and supports that they're entitled to at the school. Um, and because we are in this, um, you know, period of remote learning, for this school year, STLS enrollment can take place remotely, so families do not have to travel to their school um, just for enrollment into the STLS program that can be taken over, taken care of over the phone, um, you know, with, uh, by speaking with the STLS liaison. Um, all right, so we talked about the STLS program and the definition of those who are eligible um, under the McKinney-Vento Act to be part of the SCLS program. Um, so now we are going to talk a little bit about some of the rights that are provided to students. Um, so the first one here is immediate school enrollment where students can attend classes and participate fully in school activities. Um, so what this means is that a student, if they go to the school and they tell um, you know, the STLS leads on the person in the front desk that they are, you know, experiencing housing insecurity, that child, that student can be immediately enrolled in school, even without the traditional things that might be required. So they can be enrolled without, you know, presenting their birth certificate or their prior school records or their immunization records. Um, and the reason for this really is that in your, if someone is experiencing homelessness, um, 
oftentimes are, they can be very transient and maybe their documents got stolen or lost or they've transitioned between different schools and we wanna make sure that student can get enrolled without delay. Um, and that immediate enrollment really does mean immediate. And it, it means that they can fully participate and attend school. So it doesn't mean that they are enrolled, but have to wait. Um, and then the school and the liaison are supposed to work with the family to then get the birth certificate, get prior records, get kind of the other information they might need. Um, and this is definitely something that if you are having issues with enrollment uh, to reach out to you know, myself at the Law Project, reach out to Claire, reach out to the STLS, you know, hotline number that was provided um, to make sure that we're figuring out um, that enrollment. Um, and then connected to that, so there are, we break it down into three different schools that a student who's experiencing homelessness has the right to attend. So the first two are what we call their school of origin. And this can be the school that the student attended when permanently housed, or the school in which the student was last enrolled. Um, so those can be the same schools, but sometimes they can be different schools, which is why we break them up. Um, so the main difference is that there could technically be a gap. So with the school that the student attended when permanently housed, um, they could have technically attended a different school after that and still be eligible to go back. Um, so then they have a right to go to whatever school they were last enrolled in. Um, so even if during the pandemic, you know, um, or any time a family had to move um, or they just recently started experiencing homelessness or were evicted, even if they move out of CPS um, district or out of that neighborhood of the school they were attending, they still have a right to stay in that school. Um, and school of origin is really important, especially if a child is, um, you know, staying at different places and their housing is unstable because it provides that stability. Um, and also just in terms of, um, you know, learning retention, a lot of studies show the value in being, you know, staying at the same school. So if, you know, that is something that seems doable that a family wants to do, they have the right to stay. Um, now, a family can also attend the school that non-STLS students who live in the same attendance area are eligible to attend. So what this would mean is, let's say a family does, um, you know, is experiencing homelessness and maybe they're staying at a shelter now that's on the west side and maybe prior they were staying, you know, on the far south side and it would be a really long commute. And it seems in the best interest of the student and family to have that student now attend the local neighborhood school. They also have a right to do that. Um, what's really important is that this is, you know, the family's choice in figuring out kind of what makes the most sense for the student and for the family. Um, other rights include transportation to and from school and school related activities for students enrolled at their school of origin. Um, so as I mentioned, those are those first two schools is their school of origin. So the school they last attended when permanently housed um, and in the school they were last enrolled in. Um, and Claire can give some details now on kind of what transportation looks like for CPS. Every school district, every public school district has to provide transportation, but the law doesn't specify how. Um, so the school, it needs to be appropriate, it needs to make sense, but the school can actually decide kind of what that transportation um, looks like. So within um, CPS schools, our primary mode of transportation for STLS students who are enrolled at their school of origin is by providing venture cards um, to take CTA transportation. For students who are in seventh uh, grade and above, the student will receive a, a CTA card so that they can transfer themselves to and from school independently. Um, but for students in sixth grade and younger, the student as well as their parent, um, guardian, or other primary caregiver will receive CTA cards so that um, not only the student can ride CTA to and from school, but their parent um, or guardian is also able to accompany them on CTA to and from school so they don't have to ride alone. Awesome. Um... And that's definitely something I think we talk a little bit about transportation after the slide, but um, to definitely reach out about as it can play a huge role in getting to school. Um, so under McKinney Vento, students experiencing homelessness also have a right to have a waiver of school related fees. Um, and the 
school code goes through what fees are considered um, school fees that get waived and which ones aren't. Um, a good kind of rule of thumb is if it's something that's required for learning, for participation, um, most likely it's gonna be waived. If it's not a requirement, like maybe a yearbook um, or prom, it might be something that is not waived. Um, so definitely reach out to the school if you, um, you know, want to request a waiver of school fees. For students who are experiencing homelessness and in the STLS program, that waiver of school fees um, should be something that, you know, is, is automatic that happens upon, you know, enrollment in the STLS program. Um, but families who are low income, but not technically in the STLS program also can request school fee waivers if they meet the federal um, eligibility guidelines. Um, and if you have any questions about that, again, reach out um, to assist with that. I know one that we hear a lot about kind of around this time is graduation fees, which are something that do get waived. Um, so if there are any issues with that, definitely reach out um, to us. Um, so after school tutoring um, and other supports like uniform school supplies is something um, that should STLS students should receive that support. Um, every student in CPS gets is eligible for free school meals. So that is also for students experiencing homelessness. And then other, other um, supports and referrals to community services. And that's something that you can reach out to your STLS liaison um, that they should be able to help kind of point you in the right direction. Um, and then I'm going to pass it over to Claire to give a little more explanation on transportation. Right? Yes, um, so we mentioned transportation um, being available for students enrolled in the STLS program who are attending their school of origin. So that would be the school they attended when permanently housed or the last school they were enrolled at. Um, and this does um, apply now that schools um, have reopened or are planning to reopen to any STLS student who is participating in some kind of in-person learning. Um, so this means that you know, any student who's been enrolled in STLS this school year, um, who is attending their school of origin, is eligible for transportation if they're signed up for hybrid learning um, or another in-person learning model um, for the duration of this school year. Once a student is enrolled in STLS, that um, enrollment is good for the entire school year that they were enrolled in the program in. So even if a student was experiencing homelessness at the beginning of the school year and was enrolled in STLS at that time and has now actually um, you know, gotten permanent housing, they would continue to be eligible for STLS supports, including transportation until the end of the school year. Um, we also um, know that there may be some circumstances in which a student is not attending their school of origin, but still requires transportation because not having that transportation, it does prevent them from being able to attend school. Um, so if that's ever the case, um, you know, where you are in a situation where um, you're not attending your school of origin, um, but do need transportation, please speak with your STLS liaison um, and they can help, um, you know, assess if that transportation can be provided provided to help meet that need and, and ensure that students can attend school on a daily basis. Uh, we also have available as an option for those students who are in sixth grade and below. Um, if their parent or guardian is not able to accompany them on CTA to their school, um, because they have some kind of hardship or um, scheduling conflict because of work or school or other um, required programs they may be involved in, they can actually apply with their school for what we call hardship transportation, which is yellow school bus pickup for that student um, from a site near where they're residing to their school. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, to apply for hardship transportation, um, you'd ask to speak with STLS liaison. Um, and then if this um, does require some kind of documentation of the hardship, uh, most commonly the hardships or barriers that parents or guardians have, um, maybe that they have work hours during, you know, either school drop off or pickup times um, so that they can't ride CTA. Um, documentation of that would include, um, you know, a copy of a recent pay stub to show current employment and a copy of um, that parent or guardian's work schedule that shows, you know, there are um, interfering hours that overlap with um, school pickup or drop off. Uh, the other most common hardship that parents um, receive hardship transportation for is if they have some kind of medical condition that makes it um, 
difficult or impossible for them to ride CTA with their child to and from school on a daily basis. And documentation for that would be uh, a letter from a doctor or other medical provider that um, you know, simply states that you know, riding CTA um, is not something that this parent or guardian can do. Um, and then that is submitted to your school's STLS liaison who passes it on to um, the STLS department who then works with transportation to get that um, school bus pickup um, established for that student. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to kind of clarify too that, you know, if a homeless student's um, resident, ha residence has been relocated due to COVID-19, due to the pandemic, due to any reason, um, and they are outside of the city, they can still continue to attend their CPS school of origin if that is, you know, what they decide is in the best interest of their child. Um, and the, it is up to the schools under the law to figure out how to share the cost and the responsibility of that transportation. But definitely feel that families have the right to ask the school for transportation if they do want to continue at their school of origin um, and that that transportation does need to be provided um, and that it is the family's choice um, under the law. And again, um, as Claire kind of mentioned, this is for um, to and from school and for school related activities. Um, so basically, if you can take anything away, make sure you talk to your ST STLS liaison um, or you know, call the number if you are experiencing housing insecurity and need that transportation and are not currently receiving it. Um, so, you know, when it comes to reopening of schools, as well as, um, you know, any families that are continuing with remote learning, um, none of the rights of STLS students that Alyssa outlined earlier um, have changed. So the right to transportation for students attending in-person school, um, the right to fee waivers, to immediate enrollment, um, any of those rights are still in place um, and, you know, should be upheld by schools. Um, you know, and that's regardless of if students are returning to um, a hybrid in person model or continue with remote learning. Um, so currently um, CPS schools are um, open for a hybrid in person learning model for um, grades pre K through eight and then students who are in cluster programs. Um, the current proposal right now is for high schools to return to some kind of in person um, learning hybrid model on April 19th. Um, although that's not yet uh, finalized, so that that is subject to change. Um, however, all, you know, all students and families can can make the choice of whether they wish to participate in in person learning or if they wish to continue remotely. Um, there's no requirement for families to return to in person learning if they don't choose to, as well as if there are families that have um, you know, opted to return to in-person learning, but then, um, you know, feel that it's not working out, it's not in the best interest of their um, student, they can, they can return to remote learning at any time. Um, the typical schedule for hybrid learning is that students um, will be in the classroom two days a week um, and then have three days that they will be um, doing remote learning. Typically, that's going to be a model where um, students are in cohorts where they're either in school Monday and Tuesday or Thursday and Friday with Wednesday being um, a remote learning day for all students. Um, I will also note that the, the dates and kind of the schedules outlined here are for our district schools. So charter schools um, may have different reopening schedules or hybrid learning models that they're um, implementing at their school. So um, if you are um, you know, at a charter school or have children at a charter school, um, it's best to follow up with them directly to understand what their um, schedule and plan for reopening um, or hybrid learning is. Um, however, for any students um, you know, who are I mean, really at all enrolled right now because um, almost every student is gonna be continuing to engage in some kind of remote learning, even if they are um, also part of a hybrid learning model. Um, technology devices, um, which includes computing devices like um, a laptop, a tablet, a Chromebook, something like that. Um, those should be provided to all students who need them, of course, including STLS students. Um, if they don't have one of their own um, or don't have sufficient access through their own devices. Um, and schools should be contacted directly to request any um, remote learning computing devices that families may need. 
um, specific to STLS students um, is also that they are eligible to receive um, internet hotspot devices to give them access to um, Wi-Fi anywhere where they are um, through the Chicago Connected program. So there are um, many other families who may be um, eligible for internet through Chicago Connected that would provide them with um, an actual um, wired internet um, hookup within their home. Um, but all STLS students, um, if they're enrolled in the program are automatically eligible for the hotspot internet access, um, which they can take with them wherever they may be staying. If you, um, you know, are enrolled in the STLS program or have a child who's enrolled in the STLS program, um, the best way to get um, access to a hotspot device if you don't have one is by contacting your school's STLS liaison. Um, and these devices should be provided for each student, not just each family, because they'll work best when um, each student, you know, is connecting to that hotspot with one device rather than having multiple um, computers or laptops trying to connect to the internet. Um, on a single hotspot device. Um, so if you know you you do have multiple um, children enrolled in STLS and were provided just one um, hotspot device, again, um, reach out to your school's STLS liaison, um, or you can contact our STLS helpline for assistance with identifying your liaison um, or communicating with your school that um, this support is needed. Um, CPS is also operating um, a parent tech support line that can be really helpful with troubleshooting um, and helping address questions or issues that may come up um, with these devices. Um, technology is challenging and you know things won't work or something won't connect. Um, and the best place to turn for support on that is the parent tech support line. Um, that number is 773-417-1060. Um, and they'll be able to help you know, address um, you know, issues that are coming up with either computing devices um, or hotspots as needed. And then it's also important to note that, um, of course, within any open um, CPS school, there are you know, many um, safety precautions that are in place to um, you know, help ensure that the spread of COVID-19 um, is minimized within school buildings. Um, so any time that a student, um, a parent, a staff person, um, any other kind of visitor who may be entering a CPS building, um, they always have to complete a health screener. So that means that any students who are participating in in-person learning on their in-person school days in the morning have to access that health screener. It asks some um, you know, pretty simple questions, just um, identifying has that, um, you know, child or youth experienced any symptoms of COVID-19? Have they had contact with anyone who's been diagnosed? Um, just to, to make sure that um, you know, their, um, the risk is low for them entering the building. Um, so that is completed daily for students who are um, entering a school building. At um, any time someone enters a CPS facility, there's also a temperature check done and cloth face coverings are required at all times um, in the buildings. So if there are um, students who don't have a face covering, their school will provide them with one. So this should never be a reason that um, an STLS student or other student is um, excluded from school. Um, they should not be um, you know, asked to leave because they don't have a face covering. The school can provide them one. Um, if a student does not pass the health screener, they will be asked to stay home that day and participate in remote learning. Um, but that would be the only situation, um, you know, or if they have a temperature in which they would be asked not to come to school. Um, and then I've also linked here on this slide um, to the kind of the full comprehensive, um, you know, explanation of the various um, health and safety protocols that are in place across schools and the district. Um, also, um, continuing, even as schools have reopened for some in-person learning, um, are the CPS meal sites. These are established at um, around 450 schools, and it's where any family who has um, a CPS student can go and receive um, grab-and-go meals for all of the students in their family. Um, these sites are open um, until 1 p.m. Monday through Friday. Um, and families can pick up meals at any school site that is a meal site. So families do not have to go to the school that their child attends um, to receive meals. They can go to whatever site is closest to them um, to receive these meals. Um, and linked on this uh, slide as well is um, 
a, a map that you can open where you can type in any address in the city and it will give you a list of what the closest meal sites are um, to make it really easy for families to find uh, where their closest site is. And this is not restricted, um, you know, even families that have their students who have returned to um, a hybrid learning model can still receive meals from these meal sites. Awesome, thank you so much for that information, Claire. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about pandemic EBT. Um, so pandemic EBT, there, we did a webinar um, that went into a lot of detail about it that you can still access on um, Facebook Live um, or on the CCH Facebook page, but it stands for the Pandemic Electronic Benefit Transfer. Um, and it provides benefits to certain children who receive free or reduced lunch. Um, under the National School Lunch Act. Um, it's a temporary food benefit program operating dur during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and it provides benefits for days that students lack access to an in-school lunch. Um, it provides 682 per each school day that children are engaged in remote learning. This is for all children in Illinois um, can be eligible for this. Um, so, What's really important to note is that every student enrolled in CPS is eligible for PEBT. And the reason for that is it's to determine eligibility is based on, um, as I said, if you qualify for the federal free lunch program and CPS as a district um, waves into that. So every student qualifies. Um, so outside of CPS, it's every student who qualifies for the breakfast and lunch program and attended a school that was operating at reduced capacity at least five days during the school year. Um, students at charter schools should verify their uh, PEBT eligibility with their school. Um, so what a family would need to check if they're in CPS, everyone's going to be eligible. If it's outside of CPS, making sure um, that their child um, is, if they are eligible, is enrolled in the breakfast, the free breakfast and lunch program. Um, so PEBT cards um, were supposed to be mailed in March. Um, every student got their own, had their own card with their name. It came in a blank, is coming in a blank envelope from Texas. Um, obviously, there's a lot of families who are receiving these, and so you know, it might just be a delay in the mail, which has been happening if you haven't received it. Um, but if you have not received it, um, there are kind of two things you can do. Um, so one is called the, I, the Illinois Department of Health um, Services, IDHS, their PEBT helpline number, which is right there, the 833-621-0737. Um, or you can call the law project um, and our number will be at the last slide. Um, we have one of our attorneys who is assisting with um, assisting people with connecting that if you have not received your benefits. Um, families do need to make sure that their address and contact information with the school is up to date because that is where the cards will be sent. Um, so it goes through the schools. So calling your school, making sure they have the most up to date address is really important because um, that is where it will be sent. Um, families who don't have a safe or consistent place to have it mailed, they can have it um, mailed to the school's address. And um, that is something to reach out to the um, SCLS liaison um, about to figure out that process. Um, so I also wanted to mention that the preschool application um, in CPS is gonna be open in Opening on April 21st, now is a year round um, application process so that you can apply um, throughout the entire year. Um, but that is when it will be opening for the 2021-2022 school year. Um, you must be three or four by September 1st. And there is a preference for four-year-olds, um, but you can still apply. Um, there is a priority for students experiencing homelessness. Um, and then I have attached the um, link to the website of where you can do the application. Um, if you have any questions, please reach out to um, the law project, to SCLS to help navigate um, how to access that. The same rules for McKinney-Vento apply to preschool students. Um, 
And one thing too, just to mention, preschool is a little bit different than maybe other um, kindergarten through 12th grade, as there are some programs that are based in schools, based in CPS, there's some community-based programs that they kind of receive different funding and maybe have different um, rules or eligibility. So if you have any questions, definitely feel free to um, reach out. And I'll bring it back to Claire. Thank you. Um, so we know that, um, you know, this school year, as well as the end of last school year with the pandemic and the school closures that have resulted from that um, has been incredibly challenging for all of our families. Um, and, you know, we really want to encourage families to, you know, choose whatever learning model is going to suit them best um, for the rest of this school year. So for some families that may be um, returning to in-person learning with a hybrid model. And for some that may mean um, continuing with remote learning. And regardless of um, you know, what choice a family makes, um, it's our job to make sure that they have the resources that are necessary um, for you know, succeeding in that um, learning uh, environment. So you know, for our STLS students, that includes um, providing transportation to eligible students who are in in-person learning. It includes making sure students have um, access to the internet by providing hotspot devices, um, you know, as in any other school year, waiving fees, um, you know, that are eligible for STLS students. Um, so really making sure that all of these um, standard STLS supports, um, you know, are being provided as well as, um, you know, the accommodations that are necessary for remote learning as well. Um, so, Every family's choice is going to look a little bit different, um, but we do encourage families to really think about what's going to be best for their um, student and their family. Um, reaching out to your school's STLS liaison um, for more information to, you know, discuss what that school's um, learning model will look like with, um, you know, hybrid or with um, continued remote learning. They're best suited to answer kind of specific questions regarding scheduling, um, you know, the types of assignments that will be, you know, required or expected. All of that information um, is best provided by the school, um, and they can really help support families that may have questions, um, you know, as they're they're making these these choices. Um, as Alyssa mentioned. Um, for the preschool act, um, application, families that are um, in temporary living situations do have priority when completing the preschool application. There is a question that asks specifically about the, um, the, the living situation of the child um, that the application is for. And if a um, McKinney Vento eligible um, you know, living situation is selected, that student um, will be prioritized for placement um, at their preferred school. Um, and just as I mentioned before, you know, just being aware of the um, requirements for accessing schools in person, um, including having face coverings on at all times, um, the temperature checks and the um, health screeners are all in place um, for the rest of the school year, um, at least. And, you know, as conditions um, change, hopefully improve as it comes to the pandemic, um, I'm sure that all of that will be assessed for next school year if those precautions um, continue to be necessary or not. Them. So um, sort of shifting a little bit, I just wanted to talk about two um, useful uh, resources um, for liaisons or for families um, in temporary living situations. So Streetlight, it's a um, free uh, mobile app and web-based database that has information um, specifically geared towards homeless youth, but can also be relevant um, for others experiencing homelessness. Um, and it has information on shelters, health centers, food resources, legal aids, um, and domestic violence support. Um, and like I said, it's targeted for youth 14 to 24, but many of the resources apply to individuals and families at any age. Um, it also has a book of bed feature where youth can reserve a bed at a shelter. Um, and it is an app and a website um, that can be really useful for families, especially during this time. Um, there's a lot of good information about COVID and when um, different drop-in centers or shelters are open or not. Um, and it also sends updates. So when things happen, um, like if a shelter closes or there's gonna be some extreme weather. Um, so it's a good app to have. Um, then I also wanna talk about the Homeless Youth Handbook which is an online resource and it goes through uh, 17 different legal topics that um, include information on like housing, healthcare, criminal law, education, immigration, 
Um, again, geared towards youth, but has a lot of good information. Um, that's the website. Um, so, and we, there also is a COVID-19 chapter and we've been keeping it up to date. Um, so if you have any questions, it's a good resource. All right, um, so this is Claire and I's contact information, um, our phone and email. So please feel free if you have questions um, that come up to reach out. Um, Claire also included the STLS helpline number, um, which is a good resource if um, there are any questions. Um, and then I just wanted to give a little space if anyone has any questions and they'd like us to answer, you can also reach out to us later. Um, then as a reminder too, this will be recorded on Facebook Live. So if you were not able, if someone you know was interested in attending but unable to, they will be able to watch it on um, Facebook as well. Okay, so it doesn't look like there are any questions. Um, so again, Claire, thank you so much um, for doing this presentation. Um, and as I've said now multiple times, please feel free to reach out to us with any questions. Um, I know both of us are more than willing to, to assist. Thank you all so much. Really appreciate your time um, and enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Okay, 